Our next speaker, Mark McGranahan, um, is uh, someone I, I wasn't quite sure how to introduce. He did uh, create Ring for Closure, uh, and he works with Roku. Um, but I didn't know what else to say, so I just uh, typed his name into the internet, and I'm going to read uh, a biography for someone named uh, Mark McGranahan. <laughs> I think it's appropriate. Mark McGranahan is a director in the power delivery and utilization sector. <laughs> Research priorities include developing the standards and approaches for implementing an intelligent infrastructure to support automation, higher efficiency, improved reliability, and integration of distributed resources. And so I think that's the perfect bio for Mark, and uh, he will talk about logs and data. Thanks for that intro. That doesn't mean you're going to my uncle, Mark Moran, who works in the power sector. <laughs> Today I'd like to talk about logs and data. But I start by pointing out how pervasive and precedent this idea is of treating everything as data. Right, so everything is data. Uh, it's a pervasive concept within Clojure. Um, of course, there's code as data, which is one of the fundamental principles of the language, and one that lends the language a lot of its power. Uh, I've talked before about HTTP requests as data. That's one of the ideas that underlies the Ring library. We have libraries that treat HTML markup as data. There is progress within the libraries and within Clojure itself to treat exceptions as data. We can manipulate SQL qu queries as data within Clojure. Our CLI option parsing tools return data. Decision trees compile to and from data. We even have our build specs described as data. And whole cloud deploys represented as data. So this idea of treating everything as data is certainly pervasive and well precedented. But I'm going to look specifically at treating logs as data. And the obvious question to ask then is, why logs in particular? The reason is that we know from experience now that the delta between the power we have from how we handle logs now and how we might handle logs is huge. It's a similar type of power gap that you see being closed by the Clojure language around the core features that, that Clojure implements. Uh, but it's also an idea that's more general than Clojure itself. It's a sort of fundamental technical aesthetic. Uh, and that fundamental idea is what we're going to be working with here with logs as data. And trying to write down some of the things that, um, what, we, what we mean by treating, treating data in a fundamental way, I came up with these, these few points. I don't necessarily intend that for them to be complete or fully orthogonal or anything, but I think there are a good series of litmus tests for, for treating data as data. And indeed, if we work through how these play out within Clojure itself, I think we'll see uh, why these are important. So the first one is just having data as the fundamental unit. In Clojure, we're very rigorous about this. We treat all of our data in its most essential way. That often means things like maps and seeks and functions. And in particular, we avoid hiding data in micro-local interfaces. That, um, that kind of hiding of the type that you get, for example, with Java classes, present, prevents us from manipulating that data and accessing it through simple abstractions. So because all of our data in Clojure goes through those simple abstractions and is fundamental, we have just a few core primitives that we can use to manipulate all kinds of data. These are some of, of the most core ones here, map, sequences, and invocability. And indeed, one of the important first order effects of this data discipline is that we can have very general libraries. So just for example, we might have a program concerned with foods that can leverage Clojure's core library, even though Clojure has no knowledge of, of foods, of course. And also, and this point is a little bit more subtle, uh, this data discipline allows third parties to participate in that generality in a meaningful way. So because there's these small number of abstractions that everyone's participating in, um, a, th a third party, say, function can come in and be applied to a, another third party that didn't necessarily know about beforehand. 
all of that is predicated on these, these fundamentals of treating data as data. So what's, uh, what's the deal with logs right now? What's the current kind of state of the art? Let's go through these three points and see how we do for logging. Well, right off the bat, we're in trouble because we're hiding our data in its own local interface. In particular, we have a, here's an example of a log line that talks about a user viewing a specific page for an application. Already, we've created our own syntax for how to represent that data and also implicitly um, serialized it into a string. So not doing so well there. Simple abstractions, I think a quick Google of Java logging will lead you to believe this is definitely not the case. Um, and this is somewhat comic, the XML here, but it actually makes the point of how much we manage to conflate uh, around logging at the same time. We have selecting which data is important, how to format it, that it's a string, uh, that it needs to come through the log4j interfaces, and then to top it all off, we, we spit it out in terms of XML. That definitely doesn't have the elegance that we like and expect of closure. And then, mostly as a consequence of those first two problems, we don't have a general library for logging. It's not even possible to construct one because the primitives are wrong. What we get instead is very complete uh, libraries that, are, that miss the point of generality because they implement all the things, general ideas, independently themselves. So for example, log4j, to pick on it again, um, implements its own notion of hierarchy. It even implements its own notion of predicates and filtering. These are notions that aren't fundamental to logging in any way, and there's no reason they shouldn't be uh, pulled in from a more fundamental tool like closure of the language. There is a bit of a bright light within the logging world um, in that it is somewhat possible to implement programs that, that participate in an open system in a meaningful way. Uh, if you unfortunately emit your, or realize your logs in a text stream, you can manipulate them with the standard Unix tools. And these Unix tools aren't particular to logging, of course, but they are able to compute against those text streams in some way. But again, that has a problem of all of our data now is already hidden as text, and it becomes much more difficult to work with. So not doing so great necessarily on these three points for logging. To think about how we might improve that, I think we actually need to start with the name itself. Uh, there's a lot of problems that are now baked into the word logging. In particular, logging has become almost synonymous with strings. Logs are lines of strings. Um, and also, the word log largely means now physical files written out on disk. Both of these are problematic because they hide the essence of what logging is, which, if you think about it, is a record of what's going on in your application. I think a better model for that is events. And indeed, at its essence, logs are a stream of events corresponding to everything that is happening within your application. That's data that might be useful for a variety of reasons, especially when you consider that as you introduce a notion of time, it becomes a record of everything that ever happened within your application. That's a lot of potentially interesting data. And indeed, that's going to be the source of um, our uh, moving up towards the, the, more, the more powerful model for processing logs and events. And again, it's predicated on that fundamental data discipline around logs. So let's look at those three points again with a different model focused on events, data, generality, and openness. Looking at our original log line example here, there is some fundamental data here. We have a level, which is info. We have an action, which is that it's a viewing. We have a couple entities, the user, which is, has an ID 24, and a path, which has home. We can just write that out as a map. And indeed, this is logically what this event corresponds to. So if we strip away all the accidental um, baggage that comes along with logging traditionally, we get the essence, which is an event described as a map. And this leads nicely into uh, our ability to manipulate logs via simple abstractions. 
we already have the map itself, which is convenient, and now uh, emitting them is just a matter of function invocation. And indeed, it's more convenient, I think, to, to describe this as emit instead of log, since we're moving away from that notion of physical strings. This becomes the general logging API, and indeed, the, the entirety of a logging framework can be described in terms of these uh, existing closure interfaces. And once you have your logs in that, um, in that model, you have this events, you have the events in a data-oriented model, then you can apply all of the existing tools that we have around map and sequence processing and function invocation. Uh, for example, this is a this is a case that's structurally similar to one we saw earlier, except that now we've substituted food for events and used slightly different stream operators. But the idea is the same. We're able to use very general tools against our very general logging data. And again, thinking about the abstract interface, it might be something like this. You have an event stream, and you apply various stream operators against those events to derive results. So in that model, we might do better with, uh, with these fundamentals of data discipline. And in particular, we, we saw thinking of events not as strings, but as maps, and logs not as files, but as streams of events. That's what's going to give us this delta. And in particular, if you look at the very highest level, I think the key is to move away from a model of log crunching and strings and files and processes and towards event processing, a more abstract model that can be mapped down into different physical implementations. In terms of what this looks like graphically, this is the model that we tend to see with uh, larger systems that use event-based logging. You have various processes here denoted by E, which means emitter, emitting events corresponding to this application or service. Those are all collected together through some single interface or physical aggregator. And then that stream is tapped by different consumers who want to do different things with the events to provide different services in terms of visibility. So if you think of it in terms of code again, uh, many things that we want to do with our application and the data that it's generating can be described as a function of some event stream. And you might have different functions here, depending on what type of visibility you're looking to achieve into your application. There are a lot of um, operations and types of visibility that have traditionally had different paths within applications that when you have this very general event model can all be folded into the same system. These are all things that we uh, use, that we accomplish internally at Heroku, where I work, uh, via event processing. And each, they all consume the same event stream, but each one does a different type of processing over that stream to achieve a different visibility result. I think the only re really compelling way to demonstrate that is to actually give an example. Um, and this is indeed the example program that kind of motivated the idea of logs as data and event processing. So Pulse is uh, Heroku's real-time metrics service. Again, it's based totally on the event stream from our platform, and it's used to generate the metrics that we use to operate it in real time. So I'll switch to a quick demo here. So if you look carefully, you should be able to see things moving across the screen. These values are all updated about once a second, and they correspond to different metrics within our platform. Um, and there are things at the top, like HTTP requests and various response types. Uh, we have pro distributed process management statistics, um, our packaging infrastructure and how it's performing, and various internal messaging and queuing uh, metrics. That's really not the necessarily the key here. The key here is that this entire display is generated as a function of Heroku's event stream. There's no special paths into this application for emitting metrics. They're all derived from the events that the services emit. 
I'd like to dive into the, uh, the implementation here a little bit because it really highlights both what it means to have data-oriented logging and also it's uh, interesting because it is a closure application. So like we said, we have all of the events corresponding to the system being emitted on various hosts and aggregated into a single stream. That stream is then going to be tapped by different uh, first level receivers. The initial statistical roll up happens there. Then those are merged together in a single merger process to pr produce the final statistical results which are emitted to the web processes that you saw uh, running a second ago. Now we'll kind of work backwards from that high level overview uh, drilling down into some of the closure code that we have here. So again, the idea with, with the data-oriented data logging is to be able to manipulate those events in application space as regular data using regular closure. And this is kind of the, you work backwards from what you would want to see with that. It might look something like this. So here we say, we have a statistic request per second across the platform, and that's defined um, with a per second helper that just looks for events that look like they're coming from Nginx. All the events labeled with source Nginx um, correspond to requests into our system. Just to show a few more examples of what this can look like and how it's sort of a general model, here we have a, uh, a statistic that corresponds to a rolling mean over the last 60 seconds. We look for all events matching a certain pattern, in this case that a process is coming up on the platform, and then we pull out the age value of that event, which corresponds to how long the process was alive before it ticked into the upstate. You can even do things like calculating global totals in terms of the event stream. So here we have a last sum helper, which looks for all events coming from our runtime fleet corresponding to process counts, um, partitions them by the instance ID, takes the most recent one from that, and then adds up the numbers in those all together. So collectively, that gives us a view of how many processes are running across the Heroku platform at one time. Now I mentioned here that uh, there's a two-level statistical calculation that has to happen. This event stream is so wide that it can't be handled by one instance reliably. So we have to do the initial first level roll up in terms of these receiver processes, which are in blue there. Uh, and then we have to do a second final merge in the merger process, which is in red. And the way we accomplish that is, again, with uh, data and functions. So if we look at our original request per second statistic here that's being computed in terms of the events, this per second helper is just a function that implements a little compiler. And what that is going to emit is a very fundamental data structure that can be sent to all of the various processing nodes. So that per second helper emits what is, very loosely speaking, uh, a streaming MapReduce um, recipe that's, uh, that is able to express all of these streaming statistical calculations that we're doing. So each one of the per minute or mean, for example, helpers that we have um, has a different recipe for building this map. But this map is going to be sent to all of our various processing nodes and used to compute these rolling statistics. In particular, it's sent to the receivers for the initial roll up and then to the merger for doing the final aggregation. And then going, going down all the way to the physical wire, we have the step in the process where Pulse is collecting the events from the system. And the way this works is there's one very thin process, which is just listening on the socket, uh, reading off events, and then putting them on a queue. And then there's a series of workers that are taking the events off that queue, turning them into closure data structures immediately, and then applying those events to all the various statistics that uh, Pulse is keeping track of. And just to give you a concrete idea of what one of those events might look like, we have a um, unparsed event that comes in over the wire. It looks something like that on that entity on the top there. And then that's immediately converted into a closure map like the one you see here. And that is the map that goes all the way through the event processing chain and through all the various statistical calculations that we run. So that's a high level overview of how Pulse works. We have the initial event stream. It's split out. 
statistical calculations, and then finally a roll up into the merger before it's emitted to the clients. The point of this example is not so much the details of Pulse itself. I, mean, I think it's interesting to look at how a closure service can be implemented in this way. It's that the, uh, this closure application knows nothing about, nothing in particular, this closure application has no coupling to the services that it is computing statistics against. Indeed, you can, again, think of what this Pulse app is doing as being a very sophisticated function over a pretty complicated input. It's just a, a global function over this big event stream that's coming out of the Roku platform. And this raises an interesting question for us going forward, I think, in this space. If you look at the, the core fundamental data structures and, and abstractions that Clojure has, things like maps and sequences, uh, we already know what the answer is for how we deal with those. It's closure itself. Events are somewhat different because they, by definition, span process boundaries. It's about collecting events from different systems, potentially operating in different languages, in different hosts, and producing some meaningful uh, visibility from that. So a question I wonder about is what is the kind of corresponding killer app for events where closure is for maps and sequences. I think it's hinted at by this fundamental architecture diagram we were looking at earlier. We have um, a bunch of processes emitting events into a unified aggregator, and then different services potentially consuming those streams in different ways. And I think indeed that that, that service orientation is the key. It's that separation between the emitters and the consumers. So on the top there, we have um, one system that's responsible for collecting all these events emitted by a service. And then on the bottom, perhaps most interestingly, we have a collection of services responsible for actually doing useful work with them. And this is where I think um, Clojure can really shine with this, this notion of an event processing service. Uh, Pulse is just one example, but I think the space is really rich for closure. Again, it's because of that fundamental synergy around data orientation. And it's also because, frankly, all of the, or almost all of the interesting libraries in this space are already either on the JVM or in closure. It's largely just a matter of um, applying them to the right problem. I don't necessarily mean to say these are all of them, but this is certainly an interesting subset of the type of tools that could be applied to this problem very fruitfully, I think. And finally, I'll just say that we think this space is so promising at Heroku that we're interested in building an entire team around it. So if you're interested in closure and event processing and visibility, we should definitely get in touch. So that was my, those were my thoughts on logs as data. To back it out a little bit, I just remind us all that uh, it's really just a general, a specific instance of the general idea of treating everything as data, which is so pervasive in Clojure. And that finally, it's, um, it all comes back to this fundamental data orientation and discipline around good abstractions. So thanks, everyone, for listening. I'd be happy to take some questions.